the, were in the business to try to win. And since I was this tall, like, I just wanted to win at everything. I was so, you know, I was embarrassing to my family, really. <laughs> I remember, I'm not kidding, I, there was, you know, like an Easter egg hunt with the family, and I, and I didn't find the golden, the big golden egg, and I threw a tantrum, and everybody in the family thought I was insane, like, or, or the biggest brat on earth. But I just, you know, I had to win, I had to win. And I think at this level, professionally, if you're not competitive, it's going to be really hard to be successful. And so we try to generate competition in everything we do in practice. So even if it's a light day, we're going to have, we're going to keep score. You know, we're going to have shooting drills and somebody's going to win, somebody's going to lose. And the guys love it because these guys wouldn't have reached the NBA yeah. if they weren't competitive also. But you try to light that fire and there's constant competition going on. You were just listening to Steve Kerr, the head coach of the Golden State Warriors, describe the competitive environment that they work hard to create at Golden State. Competition, joy, and compassion, those are their core values at Golden State. And oftentimes, though, those values can seem at odds with each other. And that's what we're really going to dive into today in the second part of our conversation with Dr. Jerry Lynch, who's been a friend and mentor of Steve Kerr's over the years. Uh, Jerry's newest book is called The Competitive Buddha, And he's going to unpack the value of that type of mindset for us. Welcome to the Coaching Culture Podcast brought to you by Thrive on Challenge. I'm JP Nurbin, joined by my friend and co-host, Nate Sanderson. Each week in about 30 minutes, we discuss important principles and strategies of transformational leadership. At Thrive on Challenge, we help coaches to raise the standards and strengthen the relationships in their program because we know this type of culture produces better leaders, better people, better results. To learn more about how we can help you, go to thriveonchallenge.com, where you can also subscribe to our weekly newsletter and get the coaching notes to every episode of this podcast. Jerry, I want to ask a little bit about the title of your upcoming book. And you've used this phrase a few times now in our conversation here, the competitive Buddha. And I think in our, at least in our Western realm of competition, Oftentimes, it's, you know, compete at all costs. It is uh, to dominate your opponent. It's to win at their expense. And, you know, just from the excerpts that you sent to us that we were fortunate enough to read a little bit before we got on today, you have a very different approach. And linking those two words, the competitive Buddha, uh, is a very unique phrasing, um, (laughs) I think, to communicate the philosophy that you're writing about in this book. You want to unpack that a little bit for us? Yeah, when you look at the title, and and this is totally on purpose, it's an oxymoron. You know, it's it's almost contradictory. It's it's like, wait a minute, you know, you're walking by and you're looking at a bunch of books and you see the competitive Buddha. Wait a minute, the Buddha competing? That's because our definition of competition is just a a tad different than what I'm trying to teach. And in, in the classical term, competition is one against the other, fighting your opponent, or losing is terrible, winning is the only thing that matters. I'll start by saying this, the Buddha, the Buddha is just a person who is a teacher, you know, thousands of years ago. And and the Buddha was perhaps, I believe he was the first, actually the first student athlete ever. And when he went to school and he studied these concepts that he taught, he was competing. He was an amazing archer, an amazing, just like super champion wrestler. And um, that was his beginning. And, and, And he said, he said that from my competitive days, I've learned all about myself. I've learned all about life through competition. And doesn't this play into us as coaches, like what we're doing? And, and Nate, you said this before, that now it, as your assistant, you're there and you're teaching the kids not just the game of basketball, but you're teaching them about how the relationship of basketball is to life, the bigger court, the bigger game, right? And that, that was the Buddha approach. And, and it wasn't about going to beat your opponent. It was, it was about working together for something bigger than both of you. And it's a beautiful, amazing concept. In fact, 
It's being used by corporations throughout the world to advance their cause, as opposed to trying to put down your opponent, you know? Uh, in Latin, the word for competition, now this is something that really opened my eyes and heart. <laughs> the word for competition in Latin is compatiere, compatiere. It means to seek together. To seek together, imagine. So you and I go out for a run and we're, we're gonna run up a hill. And is it like competing with me means you're gonna drop me and you're gonna be the first one to the top and raise your hands and feel like you're better than me? Or are you gonna push the pace to find out how good you can be? And also in the process, what happens is because you're running so well at this moment, I'm following you and I'm digging down deep to see what I'm made of and what I've got. And at the top of the hill, we both hold each other in high esteem and we high five each other. And, and we say, my God, I never thought I could do that. And I did it because Nate and JP, you guys were really pushing it. Like the, you had the, the pedal to the metal and, and I wasn't feeling good that day, but because you were there, you forced me to go even further and deeper than whatever I had. And that's what the Buddha message is all about. It's about, can we work together? Can our opponent be our partner? And winning is fun. Winning is good. And I will take a win. But in losing, we also have the greatest mentor and the greatest teacher we'll ever experience. And loss is our greatest teacher. And I tell that to teams all the time. You know, after a bad weekend, after a tough weekend, I don't call it a bad weekend. That's just a slip. But after, after a good weekend of competing, I'll say to a team, like I said this to the, the San Jose earthquakes. I work with the, the pro soccer team here. This is back during the season. After, after a, a tough loss, I said to them, this is Tuesday. They played Sunday. I said, tell me why you're, better, you're a better team and a better bunch of athletes than you were before that loss on Sunday. And they were all like, what? You know, like, wait a minute. I said, yeah, tell me why you're a better team. So they started to identify all the things they had learned from that setback and then made a commitment to not doing that ever again. And the next six games, they next four games, they went out and won. Not necessarily because of that conversation, but I know this, that I steered them onto the path, the Buddha path. In fact, in this book called The Competitive Buddha that you're referring to, I have a chapter in there and it's called, uh, what is it? It's called The Dancing the dancing Kaizen quakes. And, and what I do is I'm applying these concepts to, the, to this professional soccer team and they just eat it up and they love it. And, and, and so competition, the competitive Buddha is let's learn how to compete in the way that it was meant to be. So that when I watch either of you coach, you know what I'm watching? I'm not watching to see if I can be better than you. I'm watching to see if I can learn so I can be a better version of myself. When I walk into a room of 300 coaches or 3,000, it doesn't matter how many, what I'm looking at is I'm not looking at people that I have to impress or people that I'm afraid of that if I make a mistake, they're going to criticize me. I'm going in there and I'm looking at working with you, JP. I'm, lo I'm looking when I first met you and, and I'm looking at Nate and I'm saying, these are, guys, these are guys that are going to help me become a better coach. They're going to challenge me. They're going to ask me questions. They're going to they're going to resonate with what I'm saying or not. They're going to help me understand my approach. I'm going to be able to try things on you and, and, and maybe, uh, maybe find a way to connect even deeper in my work. And, and so I'm not threatened by that. And, and, and it's, I'm competing. And what am I competing with? I'm, I'm competing with myself. Can I be better? Like, if you come to our next conference, I guarantee you that I will be a better version of myself than I was when we first met. I guarantee it. And I know that because... I'm a student and I'm learning. And why would I not use what I'm learned, what I've learned? And, and so I know I'm a better version of myself. And I also know that you're better versions of yourselves because you're learners, you're seekers. That's why we're doing this thing together, this podcast. And, and so we're all learning together how to be better with each other. That's the Buddha message. That's what it means to compete like the Buddha and, and coach like the Buddha. So we have all of these wonderful examples in the book like uh, i'm talking about kobe bryant kobe bryant was was the the penultimate competitive buddha 
he was the Buddha. I mean, his his Mamba mentality, and in the book I, I show this, and his Mamba mentality, his mental construct was parallel to the way the Buddha competed. And and and, and that's what I just explained. So it's interesting how we can look at the Mamba mentality and not realize that, you know, what we're really looking at here is something that's 2,500 years old. And by the way, by the way, for those of you out there who want to know a little bit more about Kobe, uh, to the day he died, and God rest his soul, for sure, but to the day he died, he meditated every day. He used meditation as a way to become more aware and more conscious of all the things we talked about today. I've got two questions on this competitive Buddha for you that I really want to dive into your experience with some high-level people. The first is Anson Dorrance. He created, he's, he's well known for the competitive cauldron, which he got from Dean Smith and he developed and he gave to Pete Carroll. And it's just, we use it extensively with our coaches. But one of the big challenges and fears that coaches have of using the competitive cauldron where you're taking the wins and losses and you're ranking players in practice is that it creates a negative, unhealthy competitive environment. But you know firsthand, you know, through your support of Anson Dorrance over the years, that it is a healthy competitive environment. So from your perspective, how does he use this cauldron ranking system and how does he still maintain that healthy competitive environment from what you've seen? Yeah, what a brilliant, amazing question. Uh, honestly, I, I just want to contemplate that for a while. I mean, it, it's really penetrating and provocative, uh, JP. Uh, let's not leave out, too, that, uh, by the way, uh, yeah, Anson uh, influenced uh, P. Carroll tremendously. And, of course, P. Carroll influenced uh, Steve Kerr tremendously. Yeah. You know, and, and, and the circle goes unbroken. And here we are influencing each other. You're influencing me. I'm influencing you. You know, we, and, and it's that Buddha, that openness, that, that, that amazing feeling of, 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 of the, the circle, open, oneness, oneness of heart, uh, and, and, and open to learning. Uh, you know, the circle, inside the circle, it's empty. Uh, it's, it's a reminder that we have to stay empty in order for us to fill up. And uh, so, uh, again, I'm no expert and I'm no scholar and I'm no, none of those things that people want to label me with. Don't, don't give me a label, but I'll, I'll tell you what, I, what I'm capable of is observing. I'm a good observer and I'm a good reader of people. So when I used to uh, work at Carolina and I worked down there for seven years with the lacrosse team and I helped out with Anson and uh, the, uh, what else? Uh, women's basketball a little bit, um, volleyball. But I used to go to practice, Anson's practice. And I used to watch this competitive cauldron and it was fascinating. And the thing that I noticed is that, first of all, it looked like a national championship game. I thought I was experiencing like the national championship in women's soccer. That's how freaking hard and how competitive they were with each other. What he did was he used the technique just to keep the motivation each day because it's kind of hard to have that competitive fight in you each day. So he would play games. He, 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 he does this. He, he devises games where you're playing against each other, but you know you're doing it for a different reason. He has, he has a list of seven values, and one of them is connection, playing together for, for a higher purpose than just the game itself. And because of that value, all the athletes know that this is for another reason. But, you know, it was really interesting because you could see these, these women, they would, oh my God, they would tackle, they would, they would do all this amazing stuff. And they'd even, you'd even see them like get in each other's face, right? As if it were a game. Uh, but actually, I think it was Anson that told me this. He said, your pra- when your practice is like a national championship game, then your team is going to go up a few notches. And so he kept that competition going against each other and they both wanted to win but he had this this thing at the end of practice they all came together in the circle and they all acknowledged each other's greatness and they came together to 
uh, to reassure each other that we're sisters, we're teammates, we win together, we lose together, we love each other. And because we played so hard against each other, at times we wanted to tear each other's head off. You know, he liked the expression, we want to compete with our hair on fire. That's the image that he had and he gave to the, the kids. And at the end of the day, they all knew it was because of love. Now there's, there's the answer to the question. So if I know that you're coming at me on the practice field, maybe not in the moment, but when all is said and done, that you're doing it out of love, I understand it. And someone says to me, wait a minute, how is that love? Well, I'll tell you how it's love. Are both of you my teammates? All right, so you're my teammates. And I was being like really tough on you today. How is that love? That's love because I love you so much that if I don't play my hardest, how the hell are you going to get better? And I love you so much and I want you to get better. So in order for you to get better, I've got to give you the toughest blow, the toughest punch, the toughest tackle. The tough. I've got to do this so much because that's the only way that we could all raise all levels. And because I love you, I'm willing to do that. It takes a lot of work on my part to push you guys, but I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do it because of my love for you. So at the end of practice on the field in North Carolina, there was never a question why, why that practice went the way it did, why we played so hard against each other. It wasn't because I wanted to show you how good I am and maybe I'll get a starting role over you. No, it was about, I'm going to play the hardest soccer I can play and take the risk that I could even get hurt doing it because my love is so deep for each other, for you, for me, for all of us. And, and I think that, that that's precious. That, that was yeah. my take. Oh, yeah, it's really, really profound and a great reminder in those practices that we're finishing that way. There's something that Steve Kerr says in the foreword of your book, The Competitive Buddha which he, first off, he says he thinks it's your favorite or is, is your best book yet. That's what he said. It might, it so <laughs> that's, that's bigger endorsement than my endorsement. He talks about, you know, when he was playing for the Bulls, there was this intersection of, he says, Michael Jordan brought an almost maniacal physical competitiveness to the gym every day. But then you had Phil Jackson who brought this calm and uh, a sense of calm and mindfulness. And those were the foundation for the Bulls team. But I remember hearing, and so my question is, is, I remember hearing how Billie Jean King, the great tennis player, said that the mindset of an athlete that gets them to the top, that mindset that gets to the top often prevents them from enjoying the thing that they work so hard for. And I read Steve's and I'm thinking about Billie Jean King and I'm thinking about The Last Dance and Michael Jordan. And I don't know Michael Jordan, obviously on a personal level, but when you watch the last dance and you see inside there, you feel like, man, did he have to have that mindset, that crazy competitive mindset to be able to be as great as he was, or could he have maybe a little bit more of the Buddha inside of him when it came to that comp that competitive drive? I, I was curious your thoughts on that. Yeah. You know, uh, Kobe actually, uh, who admired Michael and, and uh, watched Michael a lot, uh, referred to him as Buddha on the mountaintop. So while his crazy, outrageous, competing like with your hair on fire mindset uh, might have been very different than his heart set. And the heart set is the Buddha in him. And the mindset is how to go about being as aggressive and assertive and as hair on fire as he possibly could be. I'm just guessing. And uh, I, don't, I don't know if I have an answer per se, but my observation is when you think about Michael, we just talked about love. Imagine the love he had for his team and the love he had for the Bulls. 
by really pushing, demanding, and that's another thing, coaches, demanding is equivalent to love. I mean, I don't demand from my kids here and they were growing up. I, I demanded from them because I love them so much. I demanded that they did certain things that they didn't know, you know. Uh, Michael demanded from uh, Scotty. He demanded from uh, uh, Steve. He, he demanded from Luke Longley. He demanded from these people a higher level because he saw that in him. And what he would do is he would model. He would model the intensity in on defense, and he took it upon himself to up his game, to up his game defensively, to develop a uh, a, a, a better three point shot. And, uh, and that's all Buddha-like. It, it's, it's becoming a better version of yourself. So he never felt that he had arrived. This is my observation again. And I've never talked to Michael. I, don't, I know that he's read uh, Thinking Body, Dancing Mind, one of my classics. But he, I've never had a conversation with him. And uh, that's my loss. I, it's not his loss. It's my loss. I wish I could have. Uh, but having said that, uh, Michael was an intense Buddha, uh, you know, his heart was, he competed for all the right reasons, but he had a lot of inner motivation that made him less tolerant maybe of somebody else. And uh, uh, he, he took that to the court and he wasn't tolerant of mediocrity. You know, if he knew you were capable of more, from my observation, not again, not talking to him, he definitely was able to push you. and the last dance brought it out. I mean, he was, uh, guys were, were petrified, were scared. And, uh, but uh, he, he, he got him to work and, and he, he got him to do the kind of things that, that were necessary to be championship level play. Gary, I want to wrap up with a story. I just want to share with you that just comes to mind as you've talked about the competitive Buddha and, the, and you know, and reading a little bit of the excerpt from the upcoming book here. Um, we had a journey and you've seen some footage from um, us getting to a, a state championship game and winning one, but I don't know if you know the full context of kind of how that road went for us. And I just, I just want to share it because I think it, it reminds me so many things that you're talking about here, but um, my, in 2016, when we made that uh, run to the state championship game, and you've, John, used some of the video at the conference of just the way that our players picked each other up after their mistakes and, and gave each other confidence. And you talked earlier about just validating, you know, even in the midst of performance, how important that can be to raise the level of your teammates. And in the video at the end, the team that we were playing that year was Turkey Valley, and we were ranked number one, and they're ranked number two. But it was the second time that we played them that season. And we've actually played them in a showcase in the middle of the year in January, uh, number one versus number two, you know, in this big like six game jamboree thing. And in that game, we lost. And it was the second game of a back to back for us. We had won the night before against our big conference rivals. And then 12 hours later, had to get on the court and play these guys. And in that game, we missed 17 layups and we ended up losing by like five or six. So it was a relatively close game. And afterwards, you know, we're faced with how do we interpret or tell the story of 17 missed layups? And so when we saw that we were going to face them again at the state championship game, we went back to that film and we looked at, you know, the fact that we were able to create 17 layups against their defense. Are we going to miss 17 layups again? Like that's never happened, you know, all season yeah. long. Um, and so the story became, we know what to do to get the easiest shots in basketball against a defense like this, right? And it's of your you know, example of how did we get better from the loss? Part of it for us was just embracing what we had been doing well. So we went into that game with some confidence. And at any rate, long story short, you know, we ended up winning that championship game with free throws with about eight seconds left or whatever. We win by one. Well, the next year, we're ranked number one, and they're ranked number two again. We bring everybody back. They bring everybody back. And we're meeting again at the same jamboree, the same big showcase in January, the number one versus number two showdown. And in that game, they got out to an early lead in the first half, and they were up by double digits at halftime, and we really struggled against their press. So in the second half, we just we cut loose our best guard, and we just said, look, we're giving Riley the ball in the middle of the floor. 
and everybody's going to get out of the way. And if she gets in trouble, then, you know, we'll go back and help her. And she, for the first time in her career, which is a turning point for her, just knife through their defense. We come back and we win the game in the second half. We fast forward to the end of the year at the state tournament. Number one versus number two makes the state championship again. So it's a rematch of the previous year. It's the fourth time that we played them in two years. All the same kids on both sides, right? And so at that point, again, we felt like we had kind of cracked the code in terms of how to attack them and had a really good state championship game that year in 2017. So we were up 12 in the fourth quarter and I took a timeout. We were up by about seven with less than 15 seconds to go because I wanted to get my seniors on the floor to experience the last moment, you know, when the horn is off sure. and, and all of that. So in the timeout, this is you're mic'd up in the state championship. So you're on TV. So I've got, I realized this at the time, but I'm, you know, live with this camera in our huddle, right? So our kids are in, we've made our substitutions and everybody's kind of all jittery and excited. And I just said, hold on, you guys need to listen to me just for a second here. When the horn goes off, before we celebrate, we are going to honor them. And my kids are like, oh yeah, 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 we know. And I said, no, listen, they bring out the best in us. And we flash forward or flash backwards to 2015. This was the year before we won the state championship. All these kids were freshmen. We made it to the state championship game and we lost on a buzzer beater. And after that game, they actually made a buzzer beater with 0.9 seconds left on the clock. The team that made it ran out onto the court because the horn went off and everybody's celebrating and they're dancing and we're standing there waiting to shake hands and watching. But the, the officials had given me a timeout. So we put everybody back on the benches we get to run a you know, last second heave and obviously we miss it. And they run out on the court and they dance again and we're standing there and watching. And I brought them back and I said, we know what it feels like to stand and watch. And we're gonna honor them before we have our moment. And I just think, you know, again, that story of the awareness that we experienced in that very first year in 2015, the story we were telling ourselves about getting better even in the midst of a loss, and then speaking to your point, and I know you talk about this in the book about competition being, it's almost this honorable dance between competitors. And I thought it was really important for our players to acknowledge that because Turkey Valley in those four meetings absolutely equipped us. I mean, they helped prepare us to be able to win those back-to-back -back championships. That's a beautiful, amazing story. Uh... It's, uh, it parallels uh, a story with the uh, University of Maryland women's field hockey. Uh, one year, 1999, they won the national championship against Michigan. The very next, and, and when the game was over, uh, they wanted to run out on the, on, on the field and, and celebrate. And I, I just said in the huddle, what, how do you think they feel? Let's celebrate later. And they just walked over and shook their hands. And then they went berserk after that. But the next year, the next year, we played Michigan again in the final. And we lost. And I said, now you know how Michigan really felt. And, and so, and then Michigan acted the same way. So what you essentially taught these young women, Nate, was the whole value of of competing in a way where we actually brought out their best. They brought out our best. And this whole idea of impermanence, right? You win one, you lose the next one. And, and uh, to get, to have compassion is what you really taught them. As observing the story, they learned compassion. How does it feel to be in the shoes of a loser? You know it, you were there last year. How do you think they feel if you run out on that court and you do all this silly, not silly, you wouldn't say that, but this dancing and celebrating? Yes, you're going to celebrate, but let's have some compassion for them because without them, we wouldn't be as good as we are. And that's the Buddha message right there. See, you're the Buddha. You're the Buddha <laughs> man. And, and, and why not? I mean, we're, we all have the Buddha inside. We, we all do, but we have to be aware and conscious of that. And then we can have our biggest influence. Uh, look, I'm sure I'm positive that Dean Smith never thought about being a Buddha, but he was like the, the, the supreme bodhisattva for me. He, he, 
he, he was just being himself and being a great human being and being kind and respectful and caring and compassionate and all these other wonderful things. And that's why people loved him so much. And that's why his teams would do anything they wanted. And that's why your team was as great as it was. And, and, and that was the role you had. And that has nothing to do with X's and O's, right? Mm. This, is, this, is, this is the game of life. So I really hope you enjoyed our conversation with Jerry. But even more than that, I hope you can appreciate what an incredibly special person Jerry is and that you're inspired by his example. Any book by him is a good book, right? And I've read multiple books, though his most recent book is The Competitive Buddha, which is available on presale. Uh, Steve Kerr says it's his best book yet. And the little bit I have been privileged to preview, it's brilliant. Also, we spoke about The Competitive Cauldron today during the episode. Uh, if that's something you'd like to implement, I encourage you to check out my online coaching course and spreadsheet on The Competitive Cauldron. The course is hosted at coachtube.com. Uh, there's links to the course that can be found in the details of this episode, as well as the coaching notes, as well as at thriveonchallenge.com. All my online courses there are available. Thank you for listening in to the Coaching Culture Podcast.